Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Praises be to Allah. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves us say in man can show Him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of your program, Ask Quda. Our phone numbers beginning with the area code are 002. Then 0238551131. The other number is area code 002. Then 0100546923. The WhatsApp number is area code 0013478060625. And we're live on my page, M Salah Official, on the Facebook. Assalamu alaikum, our first caller to the program tonight. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Khadija from the USA. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Khadija. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, how is your family? I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Sister Khadija. May Allah bless you. Okay. I have a question. Um, if a woman's husband passed away and uh, she's finished her four months and ten days, is there anything special that we're supposed to do for her uh, as Muslims? Or we just... Um, go on as normal. Uh, I'm asking for a friend who is supposed to finish her four months in leave. She's, she's left with only eight days now. Okay. Got your question. Yes, thank sister. you. Barakallahu feekum. Wa feekum barak. As the Quran says, وَالَّذِينَ يُتَوَفَّوْنَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَذَرُونَ أَزْوَاجًا يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ وَعَشْرًا The ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah those who die among you and they leave behind wives, widows, يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ They remain mourning the death of their husbands four months and ten days. فَإِذَا بَلَغْنَ أَجَلَهُنَّ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِيمَا فَعَنَّ فِي أَنفُسِهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ So once they reached the term and they finished the four months and ten days, now they can live a regular life. يعني she can go out to work, to buy her uh, stuff, to attend her classes, to visit her family. She can travel for Umrah, for Hajj, for whatever permitted travel or business. She can manage her own business and she can start accepting marriage proposals. Look at the following ayah. You asked a very interesting question, Sister Khadija. The following ayah says, لا جناح عليكم فيما عرضتم به من خطبة النساء أو أكننتم في أنفسكم. Originally, whenever a widow is mourning the death of her of her husband for four months and ten days, it is not permitted for any person, even if he is interested in marrying her and looking after her kids, and he has a good intention. It is absolutely forbidden to propose to a woman during her mourning period of the death of her husband, four months and ten days. But giving a hint is okay. Like when somebody's sister says, Sister, inshallah, Allah will give you a better replacement. Don't worry, Allah will send somebody uh, who will look after your kids. Uh, you're a good person and somebody is looking for uh, you already but you do not propose directly. This is not permitted. We all know that losing one's husband is a big dilemma, especially if she has kids. Sometimes the sister is well off, the husband left behind plenty of wealth, and she wants to devote the rest of her life to raise the kids. May Allah bless you. Inshallah, when they both enter paradise, they will be a husband and wife in paradise the man who died first and the wife who joined him later. But if she marries somebody else, then eventually she will be the wife of the last husband she was married to in dunya, whenever they all enter paradise. 
So if the sister is open for the idea of getting married for a reason or another, sometimes the widow is very young, 19, 20, 21, and she has a long way to go, and she has a couple kids. She doesn't have somebody to support her. So the idea of marrying her in order to support the family and look after the orphans is a good idea, is recommended, you know. Uh, she doesn't have a job. The husband didn't leave any wealth behind to support the family. So after the four months and ten days, Sister Khadija, one thing you can do if the sister is open for the idea of getting married, that you can recommend her for others. Talk about her before others in order to facilitate this process. If she was open for this idea or she would accept Otherwise, after four months and ten days, there is no mourning, brothers and sisters. If she wants to wear kohl at home, she wants to wear makeup, she wants to go out, all of that is permissible. Of course, when you walk uh, out and when you go out of your house, you're not supposed to wear any makeup, whether you are mourning the death of your husband or your husband is still alive or years later. The idea of commanding women to wear hijab upon leaving the house is under any circumstances. May Allah bless you, Sister Khadija, for taking care of your friends or your sisters. Assalamu alaikum. Tima from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum. Ya Tima. Ahlan wa sahlan. How are you, Tima? Fine. Uh, how are you too? Going doing fine, alhamdulillah. Go ahead, what is your question, my brother? Alhamdulillah. Um, Ustaz, I have a few questions to ask. Yes, go ahead. Um, about um, three, four months ago, I went to my bank job and I traveled to Potipar now. And I'm asking for what I earn about from that bank. Should I leave it now or dispose it? Or can I use that? My clothes that I bought from that salary, since I know that uh, that salary is haram. Mm. So what can I do with, with, with that, um, my clothes that I bought from that? And please pray for me, things are hard. I left that job and I went to a country in Cote d'Ivoire. Things are not easy right now with me. Can you please make dua? I'm not to tell you, I really love you so much. I follow you on Ithra TV. Mm. Okay. Barakallahu feek, Tima. May Allah bless you and your family. And before I take another call, my dear respected viewers, please pray for our brother, Tima. May Allah uh, increase his risk, his provision, and make all his earning lawful and from lawful means. Amen. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Ali from the USA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Brother Ali. Hello, yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to know about the uh, Ruan al Madiri. It's a free flow of food that comes out due to the arousal um, about how to purify oneself from that. Uh, is it absolutely mandatory that one um, that he washes the whole private part, like penis and testicle, after in, in order to be pure for prayer? That's my one question. That's your only question. I have a question for you, Ali. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This free ejaculation sexual fluid is it something that happens as a result of stimulation like masturbation without actually ejaculating sexual discharge or, uh, yeah like that or like looking or thoughts or whatever okay Th there is a difference though between thoughts and between what I mentioned stimulation physical stimulation no, no, no stimulation no, no physical no stimulation. stimulation okay got your question no. Thank you. Barakallahu feek. Thank you, Brother Ali from USA. Okay. So, uh, 
Brother Tima from Gambia, once again, I make dua, may Allah bless you and your family, and inshallah, in my prayer, and in my federal prayer, I will make dua for you. And I'm very certain, because you're a person who showed Allah the Almighty that you are sincere in your will and your intention, and very determined to abandon the haram and to earn lawfully, that Allah will provide you from means which you have never expected nor imagined, and He will make it easy for you. Trust Allah, be patient, and for the time being, a person who doesn't have the means, it's okay to use a clothes which you purchased earlier, or the car which you purchased earlier from your earning and from your salary. Uh, I need to bring to your attention here, brothers and sisters, that depends on the condition of the person and the level of the iman of a person. Yani, in the case of Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiyallahu anhu, when his servant bought him food and he was starving, so he started eating immediately. And after he ate a bit, his servant said, this is the first time he never asked me, where did I get the food from? He said, yeah, I was hungry, so where did you get it from? He said, I had some money saving, which I have earned before Islam. I used to trick people and pretend that I'm a fortune teller. So I used to tell them about the future, and they would pay me for that, like a soothsayer or a fortune teller. So this is some money that I saved out of this fake job. Abu Bakr Siddiq, upon hearing that, he had already eaten. If you ask me about the hook, he is not blameworthy. The food that he ate, for him it's halal. He didn't know that he didn't earn it himself unlawfully, and he assumed it is halal. But Abu Bakr Siddiq is not like that. So he stuffed his finger, index finger, in his esophagus, and he started inducing vomiting until he threw up everything in his stomach. That man said that he was about to take out his intestine. He wanted to empty his stomach completely so that he would not retain anything from the food which was purchased for money that was earned unlawfully. I also have another interesting story about Imam Abu Hanifa to share with you, inshallah, after this call. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Naheed from the KSA. Yeah, uh, I'm coming from uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, recently, my one of my friend's daughter, she got married to a, uh, a person who was a Hindu. Then later, he became a Muslim. And um, they were married for a few months. Then they had few um, problems and they had few fights. And then uh, the boy has gone to his. Yes. I'm listening. I'm listening. Go ahead. Then what happened? Yeah. The boy, the boy has the boy recently. The boy has gone to his parents' house, and he says that now no more he follows Islam, and he's not interested in the religion. So. In this condition, what is the ruling for the girl? Whether she has the marriage is uh, uh, still there, or she has to apply for, she has to take kula from him, or he, she she has to ask the talaq from him. What is the ruling about this? Okay, I got your question, Sister Nahid, and I like to echo your question so many times, so that a lot of the young viewers. A lot of our beautiful teenage girls who fall in love with a non-Muslim guy. And then they know that it is not permitted, it is not permissible for a Muslim woman to marry but a Muslim man. So she convinces the guy whom she is in love with that you got to accept Islam so that my parents will let you marry me and will let us get married. So he accepts Islam only verbally. And that happens a lot. So my dear sisters, look, the question that Sister Naheed presented right now happens a lot. If the person didn't accept Islam because he loves it, because he's convinced, please do not marry him. We don't count that as an Islam. If the person didn't choose to accept Islam and he offered a lot of sacrifices for the sake of his religion, in addition to 
being regular in offering their prayers and doing the ibadat on a regular basis, then he is not Muslim yet. Or at least he is not a true Muslim. So do not take it lightly and say, well, by time he will get used to it. By time he will start praying. We have a bunch of questions like that. That he never ever offered a single prayer. He only said the shahada and he used to come to me in my center. They need just a certificate. This white guy like the Pakistani girl, like the Arab girl, and she said, my dad will never let you marry me unless if you accept Islam. So he comes to me and said, oh, you're the imam here. Yes, uh, I want to become Muslim. Why? The question I asked, what do you know about Islam? Wallahi, some of them were very honest. They don't know anything. And they don't care much about the religion. And he says it point blank. Well, I love this girl. Um, and she says that her parents will not let me marry her unless if he become Muslim. So I want to become Muslim. So he doesn't even know the difference between Muslim and Muslim. Okay. It will be a big fault on my side to just give him a certificate and stamp it and make takbir and count another person into Islam, which, he, which never happened. He never did. But I will answer you, inshallah, after this call. Assalamu alaikum. Afridi from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Afridi, welcome to Ask Wada. Sheikh, it is, is it mandatory to recite Surah Al Fatiha while praying at congregation? Some scholars said yes, it is mandatory, or another group says no, it is not mandatory. Now, my question is what to follow? Okay, you're asking about the congregational prayer or if you're praying by yourself? Uh, praying at congregation, do I need to recite Surah Al-Fatiha? Got your question. Right now, inshallah, you'll hear the answer. Do you have another one? No, no shame. All right, thank you. I need to go back to Ali's question. He, Ali asked about something in Islamic jurisprudence which is called Mazia. Mazi. There are three names, three terms that every Muslim should be aware of. There is Mani, there is Mazi, and there is Waj. Because each one would have a hukm. Al Mani is a sexual discharge which happens as a result of ejaculation, whether due to sexual intercourse, due to wood dream when the person is asleep or due to self-stimulation such as masturbation. And we know this is forbidden. But we need to learn about the hukm. What after there is a sexual discharge? This sexual discharge makes the person in a condition of major impurity. In order to lift it, I need to take wash, wash the entire body, the private part, make wudu, and wash the entire body. Both parties, the man and the woman, have to have to perform most. Okay, so that would left the measure impurity. In the case of al mazia it is categorized as sexual discharge, but not fully due to the fact that it was not ejected via ejaculation. And it was not ejected the same way like al mani Rather, it may happen as a result our viewers said, thinking, mere thinking, okay? The person may be sexually active. He saw something. So it led to an excretion of a drop or two, of a viscid excretion. It's colorless. It is not like the mani, which is viscid, milky color, and white. The mazi would only require the person as in the hadith of Suhail ibn Hanif. It's a sound hadith. And also the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He suffered of this problem and he couldn't ask the Prophet sallallahu directly because he was married to his daughter Fatima. And this is kind of embarrassing question. So he asked another companion by the name Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad to ask the Prophet sallallahu on his behalf. What was the answer? That doesn't require ghusl. 
the person is required to wash his private part only. The private part, the genitals. And then make wudu, and that's it. But uh, what about the undergarment, the underwear? It was soiled with this viscid, colorless excretion. So it's hard to tell which part. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, it will be sufficient to do this, to fill your hand. يعني in other words, in English, to sprinkle some water on it. Also, I don't have to wash it. No, you don't have to wash it. So we understand from that, the madhi is impure. It needs to be sprinkled and removed. If you know that, where is the spot? Al-wadi, al is not a sexual discharge. It is something that happens after urination. A drop or two due to being exhausted or fatigued, which may fall afterward. Again, you would need to purify the spot, wash one's private, and make wudu without the need to perform ghusl. Sometimes the person may overcome the problem of al madhi by diverting his attention, by not letting go to think about something that may excite him or stimulate him sexually. And sometimes you have no control over it. As we mentioned in the previous hadith, in this case, you just need to purify yourself by washing your public part, the genitals, and making wudu. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Muddathir from India. Assalamu alaikum, brother Muddathir. Sheikh, how are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, thank you for asking, and welcome to Ask Uda. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question. Uh, what is the exact start and end time of Maghrib and Isha prayer? Okay. Thank you, Muddath. Right away, inshallah, after Nahid and Afridi. Sister Nahid from the KSA. Whenever somebody apostates, when we say apostated or irtadda, because apparently he said the shahada, and he pretended to be Muslim. So that's why we dealt with him as Muslim. And if he were to die in this condition, so there is inheritance applied there, and they would offer the funeral for him like a Muslim, and would bury him in the Muslim graveyard, would make dua for him, even if he was faking it. But we deal with people according to what they show, their apparent claims. And what is in the heart is totally between the servant and his creator. We have no access to verify that. But since he apostated and he converted from Islam to whichever religion, then uh, we give him the benefit of doubt. So if he has an access or if you have an access to him, invite him over. Hey, Habibi, what is wrong? What do you have in mind? Maybe he's confused. Maybe you have some misconceptions. Maybe he was under pressure. Maybe he wanted to take revenge from his wife or his in-laws for a reason or another. Anything may have happened. So the biggest concern isn't about marriage or divorce. The biggest concern is concerning belief or disbelief. We need to resolve this matter. We're not going to force him. We need to know what happened. You have misconceptions. You heard something that you need to verify. No, 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 no. Listen up, guys. I actually never accepted Islam. I just wanted to marry the girl. And since after we got married, I figured that she's not really the cool girl I was uh, looking for. So I'm backing off. Okay, so he never accepted Islam, actually. So what about this marriage uh, contract that he had with the girl? We do what is known as fasq, separation. Whether he likes it or he doesn't. Why? He doesn't have an access over a Muslim woman anymore. Obviously, here I'm presenting the Islamic law. But if you live in, in a Muslim country, which applies the Islamic law in the court, in the family law, Islamic family law. But otherwise, if you live in, in a non-Muslim country, you would have to follow the procedures of filing for divorce and going through the civil divorce paperwork. Wallahu ta'ala. A'la wa a'lam. Assalamu alaikum. Ihsan from Sri Lanka. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? 
I'm doing fine. Alhamdulillah, Ihsan. How about yourself, brother? Alhamdulillah, very good. Um, my question, Sheikh, is um, is there any merit or barka having the name Fatima for a girl or Muhammad for a boy in front of the real name? In front of the real name, you mean making a compound or a, uh, yes, a complex name, like more than one name? Yes. Okay, as a matter of fact, no whatsoever. The sunnah is to give one name to the person. Why you guys do like the person has multiple names? Uh, Muhammad Salahuddin Ahmad, all of that is only his name. So his name is uh, whatever, and you put another name or two or three names. It's only one name. So it's either Muhammad or whatever other name you choose, as long as it's a good name. Adam, uh, Ismail, Ibrahim, Hassan, whatever name you like, Fatima, or any other good name, uh, Zainab, Sali, Hind, okay? The idea of having compound names, more than one name for the person, is not actually from the Sunnah. Barakallah fiq. But now, to expand on your question, what about, is there any, you know, preference or virtues for giving my daughter the name Fatima over other names? I would say yes, of course. Imagine as she is a child. Fatima, mashallah, what a beautiful name. Why Fatima? Well, I was named after the Prophet's daughter. Who's Fatima? She grows up learning about Fatima, trying to embody the traits of Fatima radiallahu anha. Good. Likewise, with any good name that you choose after um, somebody, like uh, predecessors of the righteous people, of the prophets, of the Sahaba, and so on. Otherwise, any good name is halal. Whichever name do you like, as long as it is good and its meaning is good, you may name your child after. Afridi, give me inshallah a few minutes. We take a short break and inshallah when we come back, I'll begin by answering your question and Muddatha's question. Brothers and sisters, we'll be back inshallah in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. I hope inshallah the brothers would remind our dear respected viewers with the phone numbers and the contact informations as they should appear on the bottom of the screen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Sayyid from Libya. Sayyid from India. Assalamu alaikum brother Sayyid. Brother Sayyid. Okay, please try again, Brother Said from India. Uh, okay, we have a Fridi from Bangladesh. She asked a very, you know, important question that concerns every Muslim. What is the ruling on reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in the prayer? As far as if you're praying by yourself, it is mandatory. It's a pillar in each and every rak'ah to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And if you don't, in any rak'ah, then the prayer is invalid. The recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha in each unit in the prayer, whether fard or nafila, is one of the pillars of the salah. Why? Ubad ibn al-Samit narrated a sound hadith collected by Bukhari and Muslim and others that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بأم الكتاب أو بفاتحة الكتاب. There is no valid prayer for a person who does not recite the mother of the book, the opening of the book, Surah Al-Fatiha. Abu Huraira narrated a similar hadith collected by Imam Muslim. A person who prays and does not recite Surah Al-Fatiha, then his prayer is khidaj, yani insufficient and incomplete. We'll get back to 
the question after this call. Brother Sayyid from India, welcome to Ask Uda. Ya Sayyid, Assalamu Alaikum. Sayyid, now, yes, go ahead, I can hear you. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope, I hope you're doing well, and I'm doing well too, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, barakallahu feek. So, what do you have in mind, Sayyid? I, I just have... For the sake of time, I will appreciate if you can present your question right away. Okay, try again. So according to the previous couple of hadith, every person should recite the Fatiha in every single rak'ah. It's a pillar. And if the person did not recite it out of forgetfulness, then he needs to either recite it if he's still in the same rak'ah or repeat another rak'ah. And the person doesn't believe that it is important and the prayer is invalid. It's a pillar like ruku, like two sajdas in each unit or in each rak'ah. In the congregational prayer, Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu was asked, what if the Imam is reciting? He said, you recited too on your own. So we have some congregational prayers where the Imam recites out loud and others where the Imam does not recite out loud in all the four rakahs, such as in Zuhr and Asr. While in Maghrib and Isha, he recites only in the first two rakahs. So the remaining rakahs were, the remaining rakahs, where the Imam is not reciting out loud, it is definitely a must to recite Surah Al-Fatiha on your own. Like the Imam exactly. لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب whether he's an Imam or Ma'mum. Uh, leading the prayer or being led in the prayer. In the loud prayer, if the Imam, after reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, happened to pause, were you able to recite it? Do it. You must do it. And if he doesn't, and he starts immediately the recitation of another Surah or Ayat, then you better listen to the recitation of the Imam. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa'alam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Aziz from the USA. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope everything is okay at your end, uh, Sheikh. I will not take too much of your time. Uh, I have a question for being serving as a pilot. So let's say, for example, as serving alcohol or selling alcohol is totally haram in Islam. So what is the ruling? Like if I'm a pilot and I'm working with an airline as a pilot, but again, in that airline, they are serving alcohol. So what are the rulings on that, whether it is halal, permissible to work as a pilot or not? Yes, it is permissible to work as a pilot and it is none of your business. What do they serve on the flight? Because you have no say in that. As a pilot, as a captain, can you ban them from drinking? Can you hear me, Aziz? Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, Jazakallah khair for answering because it was my concern that whether it's permissible to work as a pilot, being the airline is serving alcohol. So no, thank you very much okay. and Jazakallah khair. Zaina wa iyaakum. Barakallahu feekum. Sometimes some of the viewers think that, you know, because frequently answering questions you hear about haram, makruh, disliked, and we wish to make it easy for every person, but we're limited with what Allah the Almighty has instructed us with. There's something called Islamic law. So imagine, imagine the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, was addressed by Allah in the Quran in Surah called Surah at tahrim Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu lak. For whatever reason, O Prophet, why do you make unlawful for yourself what Allah has made lawful for you? So it is not only that making unlawful lawful, which is like a major sin, but also making 
lawful, unlawful is as bad. So we, we, we're trying our best and that's why by the end of the program we invoke Allah and we ask Him to pardon us and forgive us our sins and if there is any error or shortcoming to overlook uh, that and if we find out, if I find out at any moment that I may have shared an answer in one of the episodes which was not correct, I would not hesitate to come back and say, well, I was wrong. And the right answer is this. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa'alam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Imrana from the USA. Assalamu alaikum, sir. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, sir, as you know, I'm leaving for Umrah, inshallah ta'ala, by the will of Allah on 2nd February. Well, I didn't and, know that, but uh, congratulations. I, I called you and I told you, sir. <laughs> and you, you supported me in all the way and you gave... You, you mean in one of the episodes. And, okay, good, alhamdulillah. Raise yeah, your voice a yeah. little bit, Sister and, Imrana, please. Um, and you supported me and you uh, answered all my queries. Raise your voice, Sister Imrana. I'm very Imran. confident. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes, go ahead. Hello. Now I hear Am you. Am I clear now? Yes. Uh, um, uh, all the queries were uh, answered by you, sir, and I got very confident, and inshallah, we're we'll leaving. And I tell you, sir, you are a blessing, and your team is a blessing for us. And inshallah, we we'll leave, and we'll pray. As you said, you pray for me also, so I'm definitely going to pray for you also. But I have uh, two or three questions. My daughter, uh, she wants to perform Umrah for my deceased deceased parents, and she was asking me, ask you, that it, she's supposed to do it separately for both of them, or one Umrah can be done for both both of the parents. Okay. Any other question? And the other is about um, my little one, my son, Mikhail. He wants me to ask you that uh, if he takes a shower, and not with the intention of prayer, but if he wants to pray, then is he supposed to make wadu or he can he has taken a shower so he can go for the prayer okay and the third and the third question is mine only sir as you said you recommended me to take drink a lot of uh, zamzam water and and sit there in the haram and uh, ask for hajj that i'm going to do but inshallah is there any other thing that you recommend me to do that can benefit us oh yes okay that Okay. okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Imrana. Of course, it pleases me to hear that, alhamdulillah, somebody, Allah, made it easy for them to visit his house and to perform Umrah and, and to, uh, you know, make tawaf and sa'i and drink from zamzam and make dua. So may Allah make it easy for you to undertake the journey and accept your Umrah, you and your family, and accept your invocations as well. Sister Imrana. For your daughter, she wants to perform Umrah on her on behalf of her deceased grandparents. That is permissible. After you finish your Umrah first, then you can go to any place, any point outside the sanctuary of Mecca, the Hill, and say Labbaika Umratan on behalf of one person at a time. So she can do it on behalf of her grandmother or grand father and you can do it on behalf of another or your son can do on behalf of another most people go to at tanim or what is known currently as masjid aisha since you're going for umrah a lot of people take a tour and they go to uh, mina they go to arafat they go to the factory of making the cloth of the kaaba so when you go to arafat this is a place which is outside the sanctuary of mecca so when you're in the bus outside, when you're in Arafah, you say labbaik umrah, and you come back to do tawaf and sa'i. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmah. Rashid from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, brother Rashid. Wa alaikum assalam. Go ahead, Rashid. Akhi, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For time's sake, go ahead and uh, present your question, please. Uh, 
Sheikh, I have a question. Uh, what is the ruling of the food that are made for birthday celebration? Is it halal to eat? Which party is celebration? Uh, uh, any, any kind of birthday. A uh, birthday. Okay, okay. Got okay. it. Thank you, uh, Rashid. Yes. I will answer you, inshallah. All right. Second question, uh, Sister Imran's son. Whenever you take a bath for to freshen up uh, after playing sports, after jogging, after the gym, and you want to pray after, we said the Prophet وسلم, said in the sound hadith, deeds are by their intentions. So when I walk into uh, the shower or the bathtub and I shower, I wash the entire body. Or even when I swim in a running stream, it's supposed to wash my entire body, but I didn't intend to make wudu or make ghost. So even if you stay in the water for an hour, it won't help. Intention will convert the regular shower into either ghost. Or in the midst of washing or showering, you say bismillah and you intend to make wudu. If you do that, and alhamdulillah, when you're drying up, you didn't touch your private, and you leave from the bathtub or the shower place to pray, well, I've made wudu already while taking a shower. So that is permissible. But mere taking a shower without intending to perform wudu, even though I happen to wash the entire body, will not do it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Abdul Hamid from the UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you, Brother Abdul Hamid. So, what do you have in mind today? Yeah. <laughs> I guess you know, you know me now, yeah. You're not driving, you're cool, alhamdulillah. Maybe you're enjoying your coffee or evening milk. <laughs> I'm at home today with my family, alhamdulillah. I'm not, I'm not in work and I'm not driving. <laughs> okay, great, alhamdulillah. Enjoy the company of your family. Go ahead, Abdul Hamid. Yeah, so my, um, my question is about, you know, mortgage, yeah? I know, I know 100% mortgaging is haram. I, I guess you can it's answer this question better that. than myself. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, um, the thing is, my my wife keeps going on and on about mortgaging, and she can't, she can't, she's not happy for me paying the rent and all this. And all I needed from all I needed from you is just an advice on how I can overcome this, you know, this topic on telling her that I can't, I can't really go for a mortgage, but I'm happy paying rent. And she's like, she's gonna go for mortgage, but if she go for mortgage. I, I don't think I'm going to pay that rent because that is the basis that I made her understand that mortgage is haram. It's not something I can do, but she want to go for it. So what should I do to convince her? I mean, okay. she understands it's haram, but she's just giving excuses that um, she can't carry on living in a rented house and this and that. You know, I don't think that is a very good excuse for me anyway. Mm. Okay. And the second part of my question is um, I have a friend who um, whose who's, um, family member is planning to do a naming ceremony. So basically the wife is a Muslim and the husband is a Christian. So my friend wants me to come and do sort of a qiqah for them. So I don't know if it is permissible for me to go do it because the wife is a Muslim and the husband is a, is a Christian. So I don't know if this is permissible to do. Okay, I got your questions. You keep throwing at me some troubling questions, Abdul Hamid. Um, uh, uh, well, I don't think Teresa May will be very happy with my answer, but anyway, your questions will be answered in the next episode because we ran out of time. But I owe Mudathir from India the time for Maghrib and Isha. The time for Maghrib prayer is sunset. Once it is sunset, you, you can offer your maghrib. You can break your fast if you want to, if you're fasting. And sunset for you is what you see in the horizon. Like you don't have to climb a mountain or take the elevator and go up to skyscraper in order to see whether uh, sunset is already there or not. 
whatever you see while on land. Sunset, go ahead and pray Maghrib. You heard the Adhan, go ahead and pray Maghrib. What about Isha? There is something called as Shafaq al Ahmar, which is like a red twilight in the horizon, which is as a result of sunset. So when the red twilight is not there anymore, it disappears, that begins the time of Isha. And it lasts until midnight, brothers and sisters. Last time for Isha is midnight. In the sound hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Akhir waqt al-Isha muntasaf al-Layl. The last time to offer the Aisha prayer is midnight. What is midnight? We spoke about it repeatedly before, and it is not necessarily 12 a.m. Maybe, inshallah, in the next episode we can shed some light on that. I will answer also Rashid's question from Bangladesh, Abdul Hamid's questions from uh, the UK. Until next time, may Allah forgive us all our sins, pardon us, and teach us what we don't know. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته